All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good Good to see you today. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. And if you are with us for the first time, I just really want to say thank you so much for coming and and taking a chance to be at a place you haven't been to before. Let me adjust this down. It's just so tall. Um, Stephanie is tall, I guess. But uh, anyway, just want to thank you uh, all for, for being here, and just want to say wherever you're at on your journey, where, where, wherever you've been, wherever you believe, whatever lifestyle, it, it doesn't matter. You, we are glad that you're here, and we hope that you enjoy your time with us. We would love to have you come back as often as you can, and, and just to be part of what's happening here at The Journey, so we're, we're excited about that. Well, this morning, we're going to continue in our series called Jesus and the Zombie Slayers. And in case that you missed part one from last week and you're wondering if that, I, you know, I might need a CAT scan or something like that because you've never heard in a church setting before Jesus and zombie in the same sentence, um, I'll, I'll take one if you want to pay for one. But anyway, uh, actually, I, I, I think I'm, uh, my head's okay, but I do want to invite you to catch up. Feel free to catch up and listen on uh, at the, uh, listen to the talk from last week online if you'd like to do that on our website, journeyboise.com. So as we jump into the part two today, we're going to watch a video clip from uh, something that came out a little while ago called The Emperor's New Groove. So uh, go ahead and roll that. Guess where I am right now? Uh Uh-huh. In the bag. Still think I'm not the victim here? Watch. It gets better. Oh, he's doing his own theme music? (laughs) Big, dumb, and tone deaf. I am so glad I was unconscious for all of this. Mission accomplished. Shoulder Angel. Don't listen to that guy. He's trying to lead you down the path of righteousness. I'm going to lead you down the path that rocks. I'll come off it. You come off it. You. 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 You, you Infinity. Ah. Listen up, big guy. I got three good reasons why you should just walk away. Number one, look at that guy. He's got that sissy stringy music thing. We've been through this. It's a harp, and you know it. All right. That's a harp. And that's a dress. Robe. Raise number two. Look what I can do. <laughs> what? What does that have to do with me? No, no. He's got a point. Listen, you guys. You're sort of confusing me, so, uh, be gone. Uh, or, uh, you know, however I get rid of you guys. That'll work. <laughs> Finish them all. Hey, you're not backing down now, are you, big guy? Uh, where's the other guy? No! Oh, sorry, I'm late. Oh, what I miss? Well, Yzma just tossed me this knife and asked me to, you know, take them out. And then this guy popped up, and then we waited for you, and quite honestly... Crunk! Why did I think you could do this? This one simple thing. It's like I'm talking to a monkey. Oh, no. A really, really big, stupid monkey named Crunk! Ouch. And do you want to know something else? I've never liked your spinach puffs. <gasps> never! <laughs> That's it. She's going down. Now, now, remember, guys. From above, the wicked shall receive their just reward. That'll oh. work. Strange. That usually works. And so does this. Ah, should have seen that coming. Whoa! <laughs> All right. Well, hey, can anyone identify a little bit with Kronk in this clip? You know, maybe you don't see a little angel or devil on your shoulder. If you did, you would need a CAT scan, I, I think, uh, or, or a drug test or something like that. But maybe you, you relate to the battle within. Is anybody, yeah, sort of, no, you guys got all together. You guys are all under the control. It's all good. No, but, you know, it's, it's, it, it, I know I totally can, right? You know, that, 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 that voice that, go ahead. 
have that third donut. You know? And the other voice, no, you stupid glutton. It's bad for you. Ah, oh, come on. This once won't hurt. Quit kidding yourself. Look at the size of those love handles around your waist, right? You know, and uh, tastes good. And, you know, before, before I hear another word, the donut's in my mouth and on the way down, right? Or, or how about the times when I'm driving and my phone does that little tinkly sound uh, that tells me that I've gotten a text message from somebody. And so I hear the voice texting back. No, you can't. You're driving. Oh, uh, you can drive with your knee. It's dangerous and it's against the law. Just this once, you know, and so you're, whatever it is. Anybody struggle with that at all? I mean, okay, yeah, some of us. Okay, good. You know, or maybe it's, it's a movie or something like that, you know. Watch that movie. No, that's not a good idea. Oh, you know, why don't you just go to bed early and spend some time in prayer? And we're like, where's the DVD, you know? And, uh, and we, we go grab this DVD. And spe- speaking of movies, this story kind of came up. Uh, yesterday at Dress Travaganza, I was talking to some of the ladies here, and which they did just a fantastic job, and it's going to happen again in two weeks, but um, a lot of girls. So we're talking about dresses, and and someone asked me, you know, well, you know, do, do you want to try one on? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you've asked the wrong person that question. Uh, when, when I was uh, at a Bible college back a, a long time ago, and I'm just going to share a story that, you know, just, we're a real church, okay, and, and, and you guys, we embraced each other, right? So I was a second-year student, I was, I was an upperclassman because I transferred from San Francisco State, and, and um, uh, and because I was a returning student, I got to be part of the new student orientation team to orient the new students coming in on all the rules of the, of the campus and so forth. And so each of us, we, we broke up into, we're huge teams, we broke them into smaller teams and groups. And we had to perform these live skits in front of all the new students, you know, 150, 200, whatever it was, students that came in. We had to perform these live skits to demonstrate the, in a fun way, the rules of the campus. Because, you know, rules can be big downers, right? And so we had to do it, you know, in a fun way. And so my skit, or my team, we had to come up with a skit that communicated the rule that no rated R movies were allowed in the dorms. Okay, you know, you know honestly, some of the PG-13 movies are worse. But anyway, so, so we're like, okay, so we put it, something together. So we decided to do um, Pretty Woman. And they elected me to wear a dress. And so I wore this long, black, tight dress. I was about 30, 40 pounds lighter uh, at the time. And a red wig and went out with another guy on the stage and hopped up on the piano. And that was it, though. That was it. So anyway, so just, just uh, it has nothing to do with the talk this morning other than sometimes we give in to temptation. I don't, I'm not tempted by those things, okay? Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> And I know these are fun examples, <laughs> but obviously it gets worse, though, right? It gets worse in our lives. You know, we face all sorts of, of inner struggles and temptations that we often give in to. We give in to, the, to things, you know, a lie here, an untruth there. We hold grudges instead of forgiving, lust, gossip, attitudes, anger, harsh words, adultery, abuse, and the list goes on that we end up giving in too. And I, I know people who have, even be, because this struggle is so tough and so bad and so hard, I've, I know people who have given up trying to follow God. And they've given up trying to go to church because they feel like their lives are out of control. And they feel like there's no way that God would love them or wants anything to do with them and because they feel like they fail and fail and fail and fail again. Anyone know that feeling? Okay, uh, I'm sure a lot of us do. I do. As a Christian, one who, who is chosen to follow Jesus Christ, there have been times when because of my sins, especially the ones that I would repeat again and again and again, and I would, you know, things that I knew were wrong, sins that I absolutely hated, yet I loved doing. At the same time, the guilt was so strong that I used to wonder at times whether I was really a Christian or not, whether I was really, lack of better term, saved, okay? And, you know, I'd wake up in the morning excited about a fresh start with God, ready to follow him. I'm going to serve you, God. I'm going to serve you today. It's going to be good, you know? And by midday, I'd already messed up, and frustration and guilt would set in and all of that kind of stuff. And it's like, ah, you know, am I really a Christian? And if so, 
Why do I find myself doing this? I must not love God enough because people who love God don't sin like this. Or what if I've sinned way too many times and God is just done with me? What if he's just had it? You know, maybe I should just give up and embrace the fact that I'm going to hell and I'm not going to see God and I'm not going to see any of my loved ones. You know, and I'd I, I, I find myself at times just, you know, wanting to break down and cry at that thought. You know, and a couple of times I have. Don't worry, I don't go through this every week, okay? But, you know, there have been times that, I mean, it, it was, it's true. And the truth is that I believe that every person who has ever tried to follow God has experienced some form of this craziness in their life. Maybe not to the extent that I have, but I think that every Christ follower has questioned the validity of his or her faith from time to time. And we wonder what's going on. Is this normal? Why is it so hard, even for a person of faith in Christ, to live right? And if you're here with us today and you're not a Christ follower you might still be wondering the same thing. Though you might be tempted to compare yourself with others who do worse than you so you could feel a little bit better about yourself, maybe, but you still wonder why it's so difficult to get certain things in your life under control. Certain behaviors and thoughts and attitudes and, and, you know, maybe it's the whole faith thing. But the reason is because, as we started last week, we all have a zombie living inside of us. Deep down in our heart, we have a zombie lurking around the depths and hidden parts of our hearts. And there we find the smell of death, a zombie that's part of us. And hopefully we'll make sense of a few things today. And so the title of the talk this morning is Zombie Wars. Sounds like a cool video game, doesn't it? Uh, Zombie Wars. And and here's here's a couple of of Bible passages we're going to look at real quick. It'll be on the screen. This one, Paul, he wrote this. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. Can anybody relate to that? Okay, join me in this. If you're not raising your hand, you're not being honest. (laughs) I don't think anyway, but okay, so let's, let's, or you know, okay, so let's look at this next passage. The old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. And these two forces are constantly fighting each other. Zombie wars, okay? This war within. So let's, uh, if you're taking notes, there's a green sheet in your handout. I invite you to, to take notes as, you, as we go along. But let's look at this. Uh, uh, we're facing a losing, a losing battle, okay? And if you've ever seen a zombie movie... Have you ever noticed zombie movies and things like that? Through like three quarters or 80 or 90% of the movie, it's a losing battle, isn't it? You've got these zombies raging and roaring and going after people and you can't stop them. And there's blood and there's screaming and there's more blood and there's more screaming and there's body parts. You know, it's like a losing battle. Nobody could figure out how to stop these guys. No one can figure it out. Charles Spurgeon said, the old nature will never give up. It will never cry truce. It will never ask for a treaty to, make, uh, to, ma- to be made between the two. And it's really true, this, this thing that goes on inside of us. So let's look at this first point here. Every person has a conscience, is born with a conscience. Every person is. It's part of God's image that's stamped into our very being. Our consciences serve as a moral compass that can discern right from wrong, moral from immoral, good from bad, holy from evil. It's something that we were created with. It serves as an internal judge that brings guilt when we do wrong and a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment when we do right. And if you're feeling guilty today, your conscience is at least partially intact, and that's a good thing, okay? It's not a bad thing. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people, and, and, and I'm not out to, I, I think guilt trips are totally bogus and totally wrong, okay? But a lot of people associate just the concept of guilt with something that's all negative. And it's not. Because guilt alerts us to something that isn't right. Does it make sense? It, it's, 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 it's a measuring rod. 
It's something that's built uh, within that is a tool, okay? And as, as we look forward, you know, this conscience that we all have is a gift. It's a gift from God. It's one of those things that humanity has, uh, that humanity has that no other creature on earth has, okay? Animals, for example, they have instincts and some emotions, right? But we have a conscience. After all, Have you ever seen a cat suffer from guilt? Neither have I, okay? They just do what they do, and they like it, all right? Anyway, but but conscience is one of those characteristics that defines God's image in us. Believe it or not, but every human being born into this world is born with a conscience. And it doesn't matter if you're born into a Christian home, a Muslim home, a Hindu home, a Jewish home, or an atheist family. It doesn't matter. You might disagree, but even 49er fans have a conscience, okay? We really do. And I'm thankful for that. So, but, you know, it's this conscience that gives us an innate knowledge of God as well. It's, it's the spiritual connecting point that we have. And so let's, let's look at this one passage here that Paul wrote in the book of Romans. He said, For the truth about God is known to them, speaking about humanity in general, instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. He's speaking of conscience here. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature, so that they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. We all have a conscience, and that that conscience, part of the, the purpose is that it points us to God. We have a knowledge. Every single person on this planet knows. And this conscience, it it points us towards him. It directs our attention to him. And if we followed the leading of our conscience purely, we would seek God, find him, know him, worship and love him because of what we have come to see and know. And while it's true that every person is born with a conscience, And some people have strong ones and other people have weak ones, but everyone has one. Some are overactive, others are just kind of laid back, but everybody has a conscience. But here's this next point. Every person is also born with an inner zombie. Everyone's born with an inner zombie. And we talked about that last week and how that came about, and so you can go back online and listen. But some people believe, you know, for example, that they're married to a person with an outer zombie, okay? Uh, yeah, anyway, t- take a look at the inner zombie of this little guy um, on, on this next slide. <laughs> Found that on Facebook. I love that. <laughs> Bring me another smurf. <laughs> See, we're all born with an inner zombie, okay? Anyway, but as we're, we're born with this sin nature that's a result of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And just like we talked about last week, their sin has damaged us. It has damaged our spiritual, our physical, our emotional, our psychological DNA. We are damaged to the core. There's death in us. There's a, it's a corpse that's dead, but somehow alive, reanimated like a zombie. And this zombie stands against everything. That is good. It stands against everything that the conscience stands for. It hungers to be pleased at all cost, no matter what the cost, to self or to others. It wants to be pleased. It's immoral. It's wicked. It's evil. It's at war with our conscience. It resists God. It resists knowing God. And the only good that it seeks is anything that may please self, which in that, it seeks to redefine the meaning of the word good. Does that make sense? And that's what this zombie does within each one of us. If conscience is a moral compass, then the zombie within is the magnet that screws up that compass intentionally. So there's a war within. This zombie... Versus our conscience. And here's the big problem. The zombie is louder, stronger, and exerts more influence than our conscience does. It's overpowering 
and it demands to be fed. And the longer the zombie lives, the longer the zombie lives, the more, we're not onto that point yet, but that's okay. Uh, the, uh, it's a that neat guy. Um, but the, the longer the zombie lives, the more it rots and decays. The more sinful it gets, the more gr- grotesque, the more vile, the more heinous. And we find ourselves entertaining thoughts that we didn't entertain, we've never ent- entertained before, and submitting to actions that we've never done before. And the more we give into this zombie, the worse it gets until it begins to inflict serious damage on our conscience. And then, like a hot piece of iron, now the next slide would be great, given into the zombie sears our conscience. Okay, it does. Now, when you think of the word sear, a lot of times, the first thing that comes to my mind is seared ahi. And I'm like, yes! I could eat seared ahi all day long. And if you've never had seared ahi, you got to go get some. It's expensive though. But uh, that's why I don't eat it all day long. But anyway, I, you know, it's just, it's just incredible. But it wasn't always that way. When I was a kid, I remember when, you know, watching Raiders of the Lost Ark for the first time. Okay. And uh, there was that scene with that freaky little uh, German guy right there up on the screen who was after some amulet and he grabbed a glowing hot piece of iron out of the fire and was moving to, towards, I can't remember if it was Indy's face or his girlfriend's face. It was going to, you know, he was threatening, you know, because he wanted the amulet kind of thing. And I was horrified. I was thinking, <gasps> you know, and my mind was just, just on that, thinking, oh, my gosh, what if that happened? Oh, what would that feel like, you know? And it was one of those things that kind of got seared into my mind is, is that, that picture. But giving into the zombie does the same thing. It burns our conscience and it deadens its effectiveness so that immorality becomes easier. It becomes easier. It doesn't hurt as bad. The guilt isn't in, as intense. You know, the more and more we, 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 we dive into certain sin, the, the, the less and less guilt we feel. The loss less, it doesn't la- long, ah, last as long either. I don't know how to edit that out of the recording, but anyway. So, uh, it, in, and we're like, whoa, what is going on? What was once clear, what was once black and white, what was once truth and easily identifiable as right or wrong, has now, now become clouded, confused, rationalized, and full of doubt. It's not that bad. Come on. You know, what's wrong for some people isn't necessarily wrong for me, right? You hear those voices because the conscience gets seared. Eh, it may be bad, but at least it's not as bad as my buddy at work or the lady across the street or the bully at school or my mother-in-law, you know, and we can go through the list. It'll make me feel good anyway. And so then the cycle of insanity continues and we end up feeling like hypocrites and we can't find a way out. And this next point, the more seared the conscience, the more of a slave to the zombie we become. We become powerless in our ability to resist the zombie's demands. The zombie convinces us that we're still in control, still calling the shots, still able to choose. But in reality, the zombie has become our master. The chains are, get attached and grow stronger as time passes and we get weaker. And we become its slave as it begins to eat us alive. And that is what we face. This is what the zombie war is about. So when temptation comes, resistance is futile. It's like a bug to the light, right? Nah. You know, you're just kind of flying to the light. Anyone have those zappers that in the summertime? It's like, yeah, I just love watching those things because they just can't resist them. Now, everyone's zombie is different. None are entirely alike as each person has an appetite for different things. And Paul lists a variety of things that zombies are attracted to and like to do. So, so let's look at uh, he, what he wrote here in the book of Galatians. He said, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, or that zombie, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, Outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, 
the feeling that everyone is wrong except for those in your own little group. Hmm. Envy. Sounds like church, doesn't it? Okay, anyway, so uh, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ouch. Can any zombies in here identify with some of those things? Okay, I can. Yeah, you don't have to be specific, but (laughs) yeah, you bet. That zombie is alive. And the goal of zombie is total destruction of our lives. Total destruction, domination, and total alienation from God. What's scary is this is who we become if we don't deal with the zombie. This is why the Bible refers to every one of us as sinners. It's why the writers in the New Testament describe us as slaves, dead inside, without hope, doomed. It's why John says that Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but to save us because we already stood condemned. This is what the Bible says, what John says. See, humanity by ourselves are losing and have lost this zombie war. Our conscience still exists. Even in the most corrupt and evil person, there's still a conscience there. But in so many people, the conscience is so severely uh, seared and weakened that it barely has a pulse. It's like it's, it's been buried alive by this zombie. And oftentimes, the only way to get the zombie off a person's back is to just feed it when it's hungry. Just give in. So that it will quiet down at least for a while. Until, of course, it gets hungry again and again and again. Until we come to a point where we don't even think twice about our actions. We just do it and move on. And again, it might not be every area of our life, right? But in certain areas of our life, that becomes our way of life. Because we can no longer resist. And we can see this in our culture as a whole, getting progressively more and more decadent. And we can see it in ourselves too. Here, in fact, speaking of, of our culture, here's something else that, that Paul mentioned here. He said this, it'll be on the screen. You should know also this, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving, They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and have no interest in what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. It's quiet in here, isn't it? (laughs) But it's so true. You know, and, and it's, it's like he could see into the future. Why could he see into the future? Because he, he knows human nature. Paul knew the zombie well. He knew it well. And all of this is why we need a savior. This is why you will hear Christians say things like, Jesus is the answer. And you're like, oh, but they're right. <laughs> I just hate the way they say it, right? And, uh, you know, He is. We can't fight this zombie war by ourselves and win. To believe so is believing a lie. And it's just like any zombie movie, right? It's a losing battle up until some savior type person comes in and finds the right cure for the virus or finds, you know, the a bomb that'll destroy them all, or whatever it is, okay? All of a sudden, there's, a, there's some sort of savior at the end of the movie that has a solution to the, the zombie problem. If you saw I Am Legend, it was Will Smith, and it was actually in his blood. Pretty symbolic of Jesus, his blood. Anyway, so um, he gave his life in the movie, so you can watch it now. Uh, but let's, let's, <laughs> let's look at renewing the fight, okay? Renewing the fight. When a person comes to Christ and confesses their sins and confesses their need of him and their helplessness against the zombie who is part of them and trusts Christ for the first time, 
Jesus himself said this, next point, that we are born again. This is what he said. We're born again. We are given a fresh start. Our consciences are made alive again. We are instantly forgiven, renewed, and given a clean slate. We're giving, we are reconnected with God. That's what Jesus was talking about when he used the word or the phrase born again. Okay, it's not some just evangelical Christian term. Jesus actually used it in the book of John as recorded by John. And so there's this, this, this new thing that's, that's happened. Ephesians says this, it'll be on the screen. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature or our zombie and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, of, of God's wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And I can't tell you how thankful I am, I am for that grace. It's powerful and it's awesome. There's a newness of life that comes. In fact, something else that scripture tells us, the next point is that we are given a new nature. The term that the New Testament uses is a new creation. And part of what's new inside is a new ability, and with that, a new desire to follow Christ. A desire not only to do what's right and not sin, but a heartfelt desire to please God. Because that doesn't, especially when the conscience gets seared, that desire goes away, if we even believe in God, right? But you put your faith in Christ, and the desire is renewed. Why? Because we're given a new nature. The zombie inside is hammered with a crippling blow when that happens. The fight is back on, only this time it's not a losing fight. It's a fight that we can win. There's new strength and new desire to fight. It's a strength and desire that, that we will need because the war won't be fully over until Christ returns or until we die and get to see Christ. The fight will rage on, but we'll need that new nature to fight. It's a new strength. There's something else that happens, which is the next point here. We are set free. Okay. See, so often, and I'm speaking of Christians right now, we don't understand exactly what takes place when we come to Christ. We don't quite comprehend everything that Jesus has done for us and in us. It, it, it's, it, it happens. A person comes to Jesus and they often feel like something has been lifted. Is anyone, can anyone relate to that? You remember back, you know, unless maybe you, were, you, know, you came to Christ when you are four and you can't think of like... Uh, yeah, boy, I was like a terrorist back then. Maybe you were. But anyway, you know, uh, but you feel like something's been lifted, right? You feel like this weight has been lifted, burden, a guilt, shame, okay? Other things like hopelessness and, and, and loneliness or sin. Something has changed and it feels awesome and it feels good. And it's like there's been a release. It's because we've been set free. And Jesus talked about that fact as part of the reason that he came. That he came to set the captives free. And when he said that, I have come to set the captives free, he wasn't talking about hitting up the local prison and helping all the criminals, murderers, and rapists have a jailbreak, okay? He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about freedom from sin and its power. And as, you know, uh, Jesus was talking about freedom from the mastery of the zombie inside, where we could where once we could not resist temptation that fed the appetite of the zombie because we were its slaves, we now have the freedom to no longer submit to it. The chains have been broken, and it's why so many people literally feel a release when they come to Christ. And here's what Paul said about it on the screen. He said, now you are free from sin, your old master. Okay? See, we are free from both the eternal consequences of sin as well as from the zombie that seeks to hold us captive. The zombie no longer has a Christ follower in chains. 
accept. Accept where we decide willingly to let him chain us up again. Does that make sense? Oh gosh, I kind of missed that. <laughs> you know, I kind of missed that, that feeling. I kind of missed that, you know, whatever it was I used to play in and used to, you know, whatever we did and whatever attitudes or, or something. And so we go back to the zombie and we say, all right, go ahead and put the chains back on. Not that we think that way, but we end up doing that in our lives. You know, or sometimes we're free, but we don't quite know we are. And so it's kind of like you chain to a wall in a prison cell, and Jesus is tsh, tsh, broken those chains free. He says, There's a door. And we're like, Oh, what door? <laughs> you know, and we stay in there, even though we're unchained. Does that make sense? And and we and we live our lives that way. But we're free. And Jesus says, live like it. Okay? We still have the zombie to contend with the rest of our lives. But we don't have to be its slave. Let's look at this next thing we have. We have God's spirit. There's something else that takes place when a person trusts Christ for forgiveness and ask him or her, ask him into their life. The rise of the New Testament tells us that God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes to dwell inside of the believer. That he takes up residence within. And I, I don't know about you, but that is an awe-inspiring thought. Awe-inspiring. How does it happen? I don't know exactly, but it does. And like the conscience we were created with, God's spirit is now the moral compass that can never be corrupted. And what I mean by that is where the zombie can confuse and sear and deceive and damage the conscience that we were created with, he can't do that to God's spirit that now resides within the believer. God's spirit can't be hurt by the zombie. And the Holy Spirit can't be corrupted. And he's been given to us in part to come alongside us in this battle, to convict of sin, to lead us to truth, to point us to God, and to empower us to fight and overcome. And now we have someone fighting on our side, fighting with us to conquer the zombie within. And this last point is we've been given a new identity. As we begin to close this morning, this is the part that I want to focus on for a few minutes. This concept of identity is tremendous. It's, even in our natural world, you know, there, there are things about us that define us and define who we are. Isn't that true? They identify us. And that we're not someone else, right? Okay. Um, it's why we all have, for example, government IDs, driver's licenses, so forth. And don't know where I'm, I'm not pulling out cash to give it to anybody. Um, but, uh, you know, it tells us things about who we are, right? It says, my name, Boswell Michael, and my middle name. And uh, it's got a picture of me, and it shows my date of birth. February 19th, 1970. Okay? Yeah, I'm older. Uh, which, which, by the way, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I think it was Easter, I was telling a story about when I was in the call for the um, youth winter camp, and I got pulled over by that cop because I was driving in the middle of the road because I was driving in the middle of the road because I like driving to the powder. And uh, anyway, you know, he didn't give me a ticket, but he goes, there, oh, there's something. He come, comes back and after I give him my driver's license and he said, well, I would let you go, but there's something wrong. What? You know, and, and John was in there. He goes, your driver's license is expired. I'm like, Ugh, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. He goes, it looks like you just had a birthday because it was like three days after my birthday that I was there. He, I go, yeah, I said, I didn't even know. I said, I know who didn't contact me. He goes, they don't. I go, they do when they want money. I mean, you know, come on, what's up with this? And, and uh, he goes, look, I won't make it hard for you. I'll give this back to you. Just, can that guy over there drive your truck? You know, and John was sitting there. I go, yeah. He goes, you mind switching? Yeah, we can do that. So we get out, we play musical chairs. And he said, just, just be careful. I can't guarantee you the next cop won't, you know, uh, take it from you and, and find you. He goes, but... Um, have a nice day and take care of it when you get home. I said, 
thank you. you know, so anyway, now, now this expires in 2017. Um, uh, if anyone wants to give me a call at that time, it'd be great uh, to remind me. But anyway, you know, the driver's license, it has my picture. It doesn't have your picture. It doesn't have Wendy's picture. It has my picture. It's got my mugshot. It describes, you know, where I live, that I have brown hair and hazel eyes, that I'm male and not female. And very important distinctions, right? It says that I'm six foot eight. I mean, no, six foot two, and that my weight is, well, it's over 200 pounds, okay? And, you know, simple basic stuff about my identity. But that's not all that's true about me, right? I mean, there's more than just this that's, that's true about me, that tells about who I am. There's other distinction, distinctions about me that identify me. My voice, my occupation, my hairstyle or lack of style, uh, the clothes I wear, the fact that I hate dressing up, as you can tell, uh, you know, my mannerisms, the, the way I walk and talk, the way I think, the the fact that I'm not quiet when I throw up, you know, those kinds of things uh, that, my, you know, my loyalty to the 49ers throughout the years, you know, even though how, how difficult it was at the bottom, things that I talk about, and of course, my actions, all these contribute to my identity, and they contribute to yours as well. Maybe not the Niner thing, but yours as well. Some of you, yes. Uh, but identity, identity is powerful because people will often live their lives according to what they want to identify themselves with. Isn't it true? It could be a music band, a Hollywood celebrity. It could be a certain race. You know, grew up in San Francisco. Eh, hang out with this Bandix man, you know. It, 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 there's their identity there. It could be, I'm, I'm half, anyway. But anyway, uh, it, it, it could be, identifying with religion. Having lived in Sisters, Oregon, I know some cowboys and I know some wannabe cowboys, okay? I'm neither, in case you haven't gathered that. Uh, identity is, is defined by our lifestyle and personality and choices, and it, identity also influences what we say and what we do and how we live. Identity is big with God, especially because he gives Christ followers a new identity. Every single one of us. An identity that he wants us to see, to know, to understand, and to live by. Just as there are things that cops and firefighters do that only cops and firefighters do. Because it's part of their identities, right? Does it make sense? That identity defines what they do. The New Testament says a lot about our identity. That God has given us. It's an identity that he wants us to take on. To learn. To live by. And here's some of that identity. And this is true regardless of how powerful that we have allowed the zombie to become. I'm not going to put all the Bible passages on the screen because there's a whole lot of them. Which is important, why it's important to read the Bible. But in it, here are some descriptors of our new identity. It says... That we are uh, called or identified as forgiven, children of God, dearly loved, body of Christ, new creation, free, blessed, chosen, royal priesthood, people belonging to God, gifted, included, blameless, called, salt of the earth, light of the world, faithful, overcomers, servants of God, strangers in this world, pleasing to God, the apple of God's eye, favored, holy, and the list goes on. You guys hearing that? So many more that are now part of our identity that God has given to us and placed upon us. No longer is anything superficial, and no longer am I identified with the zombie inside of me. Instead, these things are my new name, my real name. God says to us, this is who you are now. Live like it. Don't live by the other names. Don't, don't live by, you know, angry. Don't be identified as hateful or hard to get along with or drunkard or pervert or uncaring or lazy or workaholic or abuser or glutton or greedy and moral liar or coward you know and the, the, the list goes on you, you see on, on Facebook so often people will, will post something that they identify themselves with 
you know, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll put something about, you know, being a, a liberal or being a conservative, or identifying themselves with, with these different things, or, or, I'm, or being a victim, or being, I'm just a sensitive person, so honor me. You, you know, I mean, stuff like that. I don't know. But all these, all these, these identities that people want, and here's what God says, this is you, who you are and no longer these things. Learn your new identity in Christ. Believe it. Start living it. When I'm faced with temptation and the zombie wants to be fed, I can look at it in the eye and say, no, that's not who I am anymore. I'm more than that. I'm a child of the king and his kids don't do that. Does that make sense? I've got something else to stand on. Do I do that perfectly? I wish, but I don't. But when I do, it works. It really does. Our new identity is a big weapon in this zombie war. But we have to learn it, believe it, and then pursue it. Just like a doctor or a teacher or accountant or salesperson has to learn and pursue what identifies them, we have to do the same. And when we do, it's powerful. That's why it's so important to read the Bible. That's where we learn all this stuff. Let me tell you, as we close, I am thankful for the unending grace that is in Christ. But it's not a license to let the zombie have its way. The Bible says that we're called to be holy. Now, we're called to be like God, to share in his holiness. Now, it doesn't say that we're called to be a holier-than-thou, arrogant, egotistical, legalistic, okay? Uh, You don't lose your personality. Rather, it's enhanced. Holiness, I'm going to finish with this here, in case you're getting itchy and you want to go. Holiness is something that the Bible describes as belonging solely to God. And what holiness describes, a lot of times we think of righteousness and pure or, I don't know what you think of when you think of holy. Um, You might think of the church person that you hate. Uh, But anyway, holiness describes a couple of things. One is that God is completely and fully unique in that there is no one else like him in existence. There is nothing else. He is unique all into himself. It also describes his wholeness. He is complete. There is nothing lacking in him like there is in us. And so in the New Testament book of Hebrews, it talks about that God wants to, he he often disciplines us because he wants us to share in his holiness. What a privilege to share in the holiness of God. Just like, okay, and and this is a bad example because I'm not a very good example. But whatever, there might be something good in me, a trait or something, and my desire to share it with my son or my daughter, there's that intimacy there. Does that make sense? There's that relationship. And it's the same thing that God wants us to share in his holiness because of his love. He wants us to become complete, lacking nothing, full. And like him. Because there's nothing else in the world that can compare to that. You following? And it's a zombie that comes against it. And it's a zombie that we've got to fight. Let's stand. What if we began to pursue this war against the zombie with some more intention and some more passion? What would, what would our lives be like if we actually believed that we could conquer this thing? That we can beat it down. We could become more like God. Not to puff us up in pride. No. The more we become like God, the more we drop to our knees and say, oh God, you're amazing. Thank you. You know, because he's also humble. He's not an arrogant God. Like the psalmist, David, create in me a clean heart, O God. 
create in me a clean heart. God, thank you so much for, the, for today. I thank you for each person in this room and that we all have this in common. We all have conscience and we all have a zombie. And um, God, I just ask that you'd help us to defeat this zombie. Help us to fight it, to recognize it. For any here who have never chosen to follow Christ and never asked him into their life. God, I pray. In fact, I just want to give that opportunity again. And so I'm just going to pray this prayer. And and if you agree with it, pray it. God, I just thank you so much for what you've done. And I recognize that this zombie, I'm powerless to defeat it. And I've been given into it and I have been a slave to this zombie. And I, I don't know what else to do. I have just let it run its course in my life. And I ask God that you would forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for trying to do it myself. Forgive me for failing. And I ask Jesus that you would come and be my savior and come and be my leader. And that you would give me the power and that you would set me free from these things I've wanted to be free from for so long, but I've given up. Set me free. And Jesus, help me to know you and to walk with you and empower me to overcome. And I pray, God, that for anyone who's prayed that prayer for the first time, that there will be something that's lifted even now. And that everyone who has already prayed that, everyone who is a follower of Christ, God, that you would help us 